excited um, for this conversation. Many intriguing ideas around mm -hmm. the Midnight Oil Collective. Um, when I saw your uh, initial deck, it said Y Combinator and Techstars next to Midnight Oil Collective. So I immediately thought technology, uh, you know, um, funds, accelerator, returns. So um, a lot of a lot of things to to get into. Um, but so. Um, I think we all would, you know, I'd really want to get into like why you created the Midnight Oil Collective, what it is and how it works. But, but before we get into that, we'd love to hear uh, for each of you to tell us a little bit about yourself, what led both of you to meet each other, and where did the seed of this idea come from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Frances, um, and I am a student at the Yale School of Music. Um, and uh, Shola is a student at the David Geffen School of Drama. Um, so we're both in these professional schools here at Yale. Um, and uh, we initially, I'm going to back up a little bit more, um, because we initially came to Yale to try and be professionals in our field. You know, we, um, it's a big honor to be uh, here at Yale being, um, you know, in these two sort of world-class schools. And um, when we... Um, when the pandemic hit, we found our uh, you know, professional lives kind of shut down. We had a lot of time on our hands, and we had both been working professionally before that. And then when the pandemic uh, hit, you know, the you know this, um, the arts were hit really hard. Yeah. And um, we started to have conversations about our field and about how to create systems that we as performers and creators wanted to be a part of. Um, and a lot of, at, at the beginning, those um, uh, conversations were very unfocused and they were very sort of utopian and theoretical. Um, but it's what drove us to Sci City to try and codify our ambitions and, um, you know, tr through venture and through trying to create a system that would work for us as artists. What, how else would you describe our journey, <laughs> our journey here no, to I creating think that's, uh... AOC? Yeah, I think I said pretty much the same thing. Hi, I'm Shola. Um, yeah, you know, going to DGSD, and, and I'll correct, I was a student. I recently graduated. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and, and actually that's relevant because uh, I don't think I'd be as prepared right now for what the field is if the pandemic situation didn't happen and we weren't able to meet during that time. You know, luckily the art schools have sort of an interwoven community and we're able to see, I was able to meet through other singers and composers, Francis, and we became friends. And we all across these different fields felt that we had um, a similar understanding of the deficit that we were experiencing in sort of the arts economy um, at large, but also personally with friends who were leaving their jobs and, you know, um, opportunities sort of dissolving and the pandemic was yeah. really hard I mean we saw a lot of the people that we loved from the field leave the field mm -hmm. yeah. you know people who were making their who were slated to make their metropolitan opera debut decide to go back to business school just simply because they had never made more than thirty thousand dollars a year from actually doing their art and um, you know just the, the people that we admire most just tended to be hit the hardest and I think those early conversations about how do we get to Midnight Oil Collective was really grappling with these you know, profound realities of the trope of the starving artist and how do we um, make sure that, or how do we create a system in which that's not um, the reality that people graduate into? Okay, so that is interesting because it does sound like there was also a very immediate need. It was sort of pandemic, people are leaving, uh, we need to st keep them in this business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so let's find a way to do that. But then it also sounds like there's something that obviously you want this to be sustainable, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. This is something that's supposed to be long term. So, so tell us, why does the Midnight Oil Collective need to exist? Like, what fundamental problem are you trying to solve? Yeah, this is a lesson that we learned at Sci City because what we saw is um, we took a look at not just the professional schools that we were in. But we took a look at um, what was happening, happening campus-wide. And what we realized is that there's a lot of organizational initiative around computer, computer science and tech and healthcare to funnel resources and capital into the hands of people who, are, who have really big ideas in those areas. 
And on our half of campus, there wasn't the same organizational initiative. And we said, you know, the things that we make, the things that we um, create can create substantial returns as well. Why isn't anyone organizing around um, uh, arts and entertainment in the same way? And I mean, you know, like we could go on and on. We could probably have spend the 45 minutes mm -hmm. um, talking about that. But, you know, what we decided was like, since there's so much energy and um, excitement about around venture in the tech and healthcare space here, why not also try and recognize that there's really enormous potential on in the arts and humanities at Yale? It's kind of what we're known for, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we are we are Yale for humanity, and we are the humanity Ivy. Mm -hmm. And so, why not try and create a system that allows access, the same access that um, our colleagues on the other side of campus have? Mm -hmm. And okay. Anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I okay. guess I'd just say that, you, you know, being an actor and being at Yale School of Drama with all those other creators, I, as soon as I got in, was introduced to a network of alumni who were trying to figure out how to sort of collectivize themselves, how to organize themselves to continue helping each other. And these are extremely celebrated and, and, and um, uh, hardworking artists, you know, whose focus was making sure that there's other people who can go into the pathway. Um, but the pathway, the infrastructure there wasn't, it wasn't really created yet. And I, and I wondered, but why don't we figure out how to include that, you know? Yeah. We, you know, we, we know things about finance. We can surely yeah. figure this out. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so tell us a little bit about how it works. And, and, and also the word collective. Mm -hmm. um, is that word important? Um, and what do you mean by it yeah. being this being a collective? So we are um, venture capital in a very sort of traditionalist sense. We have a two fund system that invests in um, big ideas, big art, big arts uh, IP um, at two different stages, a seed stage and a series A stage. Um, and what we really wanted to do was we wanted to create a system in which people were, were incentivized and rewarded for working together. And um, the way that we went about that is we said, what if we could create a system in which people were financially incentivized to collaborate, you know, to collectivize, to be this community that, that was like working on projects? What if I, you know, as a composer could lend, you know, my skills to Shola as an actor, knowing that at the end of the day, we would all financially benefit? And so um, this is where I wanted to give a great shout out to our uh, partners at the Yale Law School, which is, the, <laughs> which is Sven and Katie, who have been our, uh, our North Star. They're amazing. But what they came up with was this very innovative venture structure in which our lead artists on our projects participated in the profit of the fund as a whole. And through this, what we, were, what we have been building is this um, system in which artists financially participate in each other's works. And so if you know, my project doesn't succeed, but yours does, then we all benefit. And that was very important when we were thinking about like, how do you actually reverse the cycle of poverty? Will you actually lift up the whole community? Mm -hmm. But with so many art projects, it takes a long time, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think people know that Lin-Manuel Miranda, like I think it started from him just doodling. Mm -hmm. And then I think it took 10 years really before it even hit the stage. And then another like five or six after that, mm -hmm. right? To, e to even kind of monetize. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I think that's just sort of the realities of, um, of, of independent um, you know, art ventures. A lot of it, do you want to talk, do you want to talk about that? Because you have yeah, experience I mean, with that. Yeah, I mean, 100%. You know, what you said is so true. It, it does take a long time. And, and that isn't necessarily because of the artist's work. It's usually because of the lack of infrastructure, lack of resources, lack of network. And of course, it does take a while to create a beautiful piece of art. But, you know, artists are always working on their art. And it, it is the door opening that most artists are waiting for. And I think especially in... You had a theatrical example, but it's the same thing with film and television. I think of um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, I think of Michaela Cole and Issa Rae, mm -hmm. and how they all sort of shared the same path, organic pathway, which was that they created a sort of proof of concept, you know, either a play, a one-man, a one-woman production, mm -hmm. or a YouTube channel on Issa Rae's, on Issa Rae's uh, behalf uh, to show that they're talented, to do the thing that they wanted to do. And then 
it took a random connection of somebody who had power, who had networks, in Issa Rae's, um, in Issa Rae's uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> in Issa Rae's condition, yeah. <laughs> it was Pharrell, who saw her YouTube channel and then produced the second year of her YouTube channel. Um, for Michaela Cole, it was an artistic director of a theater that said, that you, now you have to fundraise, but we're gonna help support you. It was the exact same thing for people at Water Bridge. She had to start a Kickstarter, mm -hmm. you know? And then people came into that community and as soon as the network was there, and the proof of concept was there, and then the people sort of organically created a pathway for them, all those um, pieces of work became productions. And I think what we realized is that, I mean, I've seen that happen a thousand times with friends, even for on a small scale, what they need, the pattern is always there. And I think it's just always a lightning in a bottle the situation that makes that happen. And what we thought was, well, what if we could systematize that? What if we could, what if we could organize those networks? What if we could get people to work together? And so when you say collective, to me, I think it's resources and network. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. That's the hardest thing to access. We, and when they're there, yeah. it's really We want useful. to make sure that like when Lin-Manuel Miranda has you know, his first draft done, that it's nine months you know, that before he gets to see his first production instead of 10 years. Mm -hmm. you know? So like being able to crunch that development time into a span of you know, near, near months rather than um, having the artist just wait and wait and wait for a development opportunity is um, how we're thinking about it. So how many are, you know, are, are in the collective right now? We have nine founders. Mm -hmm. um, and after hearing that Alibaba has 18 founders, I feel so much better about everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we always thought about ourselves as a little bit of an anomaly, and a little bit of an anomaly. <laughs> um, we've uh, incubated at this point 20 artists, and we're about to bring in our third cohort of um, 10 more artists. Mm -hmm. So after, um, in February, we'll, we will have incubated 30 30 artists and their projects. So I'd love to hear about the two-stage model. Tell, mm -hmm. tell everyone about how you go through the different phases of, mm -hmm. your, of your program. And then also I'd love to hear how you green light projects. Like what's the group validation process? Totally. Do you want to take the, um, the model and I can talk about validation? Yeah. You know, our model, we start with, it's sort of a pretty simple pathway. We have, a, we have two funds. One is the Spark Fund and one is the Alpha Fund. Before you can enter the Spark Fund, you could, or an artist will go through incubation. Basically, they'll apply, they'll get in, and there's this period in which they'll not only critically uh, work on their piece, dramaturgically work on their piece, but they'll figure out what their audience is. They'll use the network of, in their cohort, their incubation cohort, to um, hone in on the best way to move forward with the project and create a proof of concept. Once, they've have, once they have a plan for that, they're eligible for the Spark Fund, which is the pre-seed investment that we have. From then, they go into an accelerator once they've created their Spark their, um, Well, and concept. at the Spark Fund, mm -hmm. um, they get their initial um, influx of capital, yeah. which for us is $30,000, in which they're um, expected to make just uh, basically an MVP, like just prove, us, prove to us that your team works together that you can you know, gather uh, the um, team you need to shoot a short film or to do a 29-hour um, read if it's a musical and um, show us that you know, there's a prototype here that works. You yeah. know? In the case of Phoebe Waller-Bridge, that MVP would have been her um, one-hour, one-woman production of Fleabag that she did mm -hmm. before it got picked up to become the, the success that it was on um, HBO. And for Michaela Cole would be her one, a ten, I think 10 minute one woman production of um, Chewing Gum Dreams that then got bought by Netflix. It's sort of getting the resources and finding the audience and to develop that sort of proof of concept. And that pre-seed investment is 30,000. That's a spark fund. Mm -hmm. Then they're eligible to go into this accelerator program that we're developing. That accelerator program um, allows them access to our alpha fund, which is the bigger fund to go into real production and production partnerships, which is between 250,000 and a million. Mm -hmm. And we're building that out and we're hoping to launch it in New Haven uh, next summer, 2023. And so, but you also asked about the validation process. Mm -hmm. And so part of the reason that we're able to, in our um, economic system, justify cutting our artists into the carried interest is that we ask them to perform validation on each other's work. 
And so what this means, we were literally talking to Alice Mao, who's one of the incredible Yale artists um, that we're hoping to work with in the near future. Um, we all read each other's work and we all give each other feedback and we all, um, you know, uh, if a project needs actors, we participate in that way. And we have this very um, interesting uh, system that lets us um, sort of democratically approve a project going into funding. Because for instance, as like, you know, the, as being the general partner of um, the Spark Fund, if I was to look at Alice's um, product, which is, um, you know, an anime studio, I don't consume, that's not my market. You know, I'm not gonna have a whole lot of perspective on that. But my um, artist cohort is gonna have um, some pretty good perspective on that. And they help me decide whether this project is actually ready for funding or if, it's, um, if it needs to spend more time incubating and developing. So a big part of whether it's gonna produce a return, which this is a, a venture fund, so you expect it to, is distribution mm -hmm. and also like market feedback. Mm -hmm. um, do you have that built into the collective? Because what I've read is it's for artists made up of artists, mm -hmm. and the artists make the decisions, the green light decisions. So, so how do you incorporate um, uh, market feedback and distribution into your process. Oh, 100%. And I'm like looking for Matt Hooper with Matt and <laughs> <laughs> So Matt's uh, the GP representative of our um, Alpha Fund, and he's also going to be helping us design the accelerator. Okay. So we're very protective of our artists while they're in that sort of nascent developing phase, um, and they're, you know, building up their project. We want to keep it in a very uh, nurturing environment. But by the time it gets to the accelerator and to the um, Alpha Fund, we're intentionally partnering with major distributors who are hopefully, um, who are going to um, be co-producing the project with us. Um, they're going to be uh, helping us um, sell it to streamers if it's a film or a TV show, um, or they're going to be helping us set up their world premiere first commercial productions on the theater side. So developers are incredibly important, and we want to make sure that the artist is ready for that step um, by the time they, they take it after the accelerator. Great, so nice to see you here, uh, GP. Um, so let's go to, so who've been the funders to date? T tell us a little bit about how, you know, the financial model and how big the fund is and, 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 and who yeah. your biggest supporters have been. Totally. Mm -hmm. So um, we've launched our Spark Fund. It is up and running. We have made investments into five portfolio companies, which is, I'm so excited about that. Thank you, yeah. Sven. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> You've been wonderful. Um, I'm gonna say, I, I hesitate while you're on sabbatical, Sven, to spend too many students your way. Yeah. But EIC is incredible for all the Yale students. Please check them out. Um, we've, we've made, we've opened up our Spark Fund, we've made investments into um, uh, five portfolio companies, um, all artists who have gone through our process. And um, our investors are, um, they're the, the people who love art. So it's angel investors who have historically invested in Broadway shows. Um, it's funds of funds who back the creative economy. Um, there's this burgeoning market um, of all these people who can see that like there's this, you know, proprietary white space that is there to be organized. And um, for people who understand the potential returns of, say, Hamilton, this is a really exciting um, opportunity. Um, we're about to, uh, with Matt's help, we're about to organize um, our Alpha Fund, and that mm -hmm. has much more standard economics. Um, so we're looking for people who are interested in the, in the VC space and making a return off of um, these highly scalable assets. So how much have you raised so far? So we've raised $500,000. Wow. We're very excited about that. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been quite a journey. Um, we're looking to close um, on another $500,000 to support our artists coming into um, the incubator right now. We, we have these 10 new projects, and um, we are uh, doing a huge demo day in partnership with Yale Ventures at the Innovation Summit in, um, uh, at the end of May. And we are hoping to raise $500,000 to um, support their, um, you know, the, um, their work and doing these proofs of concept. 
And then the, for, um, the alpha, or for the accelerator, we're hoping to raise um, $5 million to support the same um, cohort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting since like for so much of it, it's, you know, the, it's like that blockbuster theory, right? It's mm -hmm. like you try to get that one mm -hmm. unicorn um, and it could take, you know, it could take a time. I think we had referenced before that movie, Anything Everywhere, Everywhere All at Once. once. Oh, yeah. yeah. <gasps> it's, <Amazing. laughs> it's so good, but it, it's such an anomaly too. And yeah. so many commercially viable projects don't get funded too. It, it's just a reflection of, it's a, an incredibly, um, it, it's a tough space, mm -hmm. yeah. but um, I can see why you know we, you want to try to disrupt it. Right? We don't want to disrupt it without Yale's help. Mm -hmm. um, we don't think that we really think that this is um, the only place that this could actually happen. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because so we we do have the you know the world class uh, Yale School of Music with you know acceptance rates comparable to Yale undergrad. We do have the David Geffen School of Drama. I so see. if you're an artist. Right. And you want to be a professional artist, you come to Yale. And so what our bet is, is that if we can organize basically what we call the Silicon Valley of the arts in New Haven, then we can attract artists from these incredible schools to stay here and develop their work. And that way they're not running off to New York where they're having to pay absorbent rent prices and they're you know, having to scrape, scrape by. Instead, they can come to New Haven and they can partner with the incredible infrastructure that already exists here, both, in, both inside of Yale and outside of Yale. So yeah. it is a huge bet, but having Yale as the foundation makes it that much more feasible. Yeah, the ecosystem is yeah. the, the, exactly. the, um, the talent, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to what I said about the alumni network just at DGSD. I mean, mm. the access that even right now that I have that I would not have had if I didn't come here. I mean, it's enormous. It's enormous for any artist who goes to DGSD, and it's scattered, mm -hmm. and it's just organizing that. And that is a huge difference from just sort of we're starting here mm -hmm. because there is like a almost like a black hole happening effect. You know, there's yeah. the event horizon of the arts happening here, and we're hoping that we can suck everybody into it almost. Yeah. You know, and I'm very proud to say that you know Harvard doesn't have this type of arts and humanities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> network, and you're just you know, or you MIT, know? like yeah. we, this is the place that this is happening. And so for us, it's really exciting because there's so much potential to create that. Like, it's not just about accelerating a few films and musicals. It's actually about creating a space where artists can come and will plant their roots and stay. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all about. Yeah. Okay, so I did want to go to, if you're answering it a little bit, but I'll <laughs> allow you to go a little deeper on um, what success looks like to you. Do you want to take this? <laughs> I mean, I know for me, I mean, oh God, we could talk, we could talk forever. I mean, th this could be, I, I don't think there's really an end to what this could look like. What really it is to me is sort of a, a movement of imagination. I think that, you know, as an actor and a writer, you know, on the small personal scale, I can't believe how much I wasn't thinking about until I did Psy City's Summer Intensive. You know, I felt everything that it was all sort of geared towards you know the um medicine tech and, and financial tech and these these sort of fields that i think artists are like okay that's over there and we're over here and everything was so specifically useful for my life and what i wanted to do just as a solo career artist mm -hmm. and i and i was shocked that i wasn't getting necessarily that type of education and it's because you know we focus on the arts at dgsd but i i was you know my hope, my, my version of success, I think, on a personal scale is that every actor and every writer can think about their career in a way that they have their hands on the reins, rather than thinking about their career as if they're in the back of the car and they're waiting for a driver to come drive it. And I think that the reimagination that we're looking at allows people to practically do that, mm -hmm. not just in terms of our education, but with resources, actually get people on a boat you know, to go, and, and I hope that my version of success, I think, for this company is that that's an international movement, that everyone is thinking about arts like that, you know? It's, a, it's about, and it's also about um, proving that arts can make an economic return and that it should be a major player in the innovation space. I think that um, the way that we plan to prove that is we're going to organize um, the infrastructure here 
We're going to align the interests of artists, producers, distributors, and investors. We're going to show that art can create the type of substantial return that it has been proven to show on an individual level. And we're going to try and systematize that so that um, we can truly start to include artists and art in the same realm that we're starting that we think of at, like with founders and venture. You know, we want we want them to be used synonymously, and we want art to be thought of as a um, exciting investment opportunity. And to add to that, you know, you said that everything, everywhere, all at once was sort of a niche experience in in the film world, and I think that that's true. But I think a version of success is if that's not, mm -hmm. you know, because it did create returns. I mean, it, was, it created some of the most returns for A24. Yeah. And, it, and it's because it's, it's good. It's created a 4X return. I mean, yeah. in purely economic terms, it was... A 4X a, return, you know, <laughs> for a, a, a crazy niche art house film. Yeah. And I, I think that my version of success is that people across the board understand that those films, the audiences want to see them, and in fact, they make money. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, it, I mean, and also it's just, it's a great, you know, um, you're, you're definitely instigating cult, right? This is, a, this is a big, you are trying to shift the conversation. Yeah. And that in itself, I think, is really um, Where do you think it's going? I, because you're such a major player in this space, mm -hmm. and, like, you're such a leader. Right. Oh, you, you, I'm, ask, I'm answering. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, let's take this chance to yeah. get a, yeah. to get a question in before we lose you. Um, I think distribution's tough right now, and I also think that there's a lot of content. And so breaking through, and there is still um, a definite, it's, it's really hard to break through. And even if you do, you can't cut through the clutter. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. even if you are so lucky to get Netflix or Amazon, and that in itself is hard, by the way, that um, people keep changing. Right, the, the people in charge, and they keep um, people get fired, they get hired from, and they get move around right mm -hmm. in, in, from the same companies. Um, just cutting through that clutter, making sure they're actually going to promote you. So that's even after you get in the door. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I actually think, um, I mean, the good news is there is great content, and it is being there's a lot of good indie creative stuff, and I think a lot more representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so many programs that support um, artists and creatives who have different points of view. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of philanthropy and people who care about those stories being told increasingly. Yeah. Yes. Um, then, though, if you are lucky enough to get picked up, first going through a Tribeca or one of the film festivals and then getting through. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm only talking film because I, um, I, yeah, I kind of yeah. know that world a little bit more. Um, it's just hard then to actually get the promotion because they will say, okay, yeah, we picked it up, but I don't, I don't know how many people right. are going to watch it, so they're not going to promote it. Right. And, it do, and it doesn't bring you eyeballs, and what you need is eyeballs. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that, um, and I, I don't, again, I don't want to put Matt on the, especially since you're on mic, but um, one thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to um, work directly with um, uh, distributors mm -hmm. to say that, like, you do get a first look deal at all of this at these very um, meticulously curated content, mm -hmm. pieces of content that we've developed. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of what you're talking about of cutting through the noise, which is so, oh my gosh, like there's so much on Netflix, you just don't even know how to choose anymore, mm -hmm. right? But being able to work with Netflix or HBO or these really <laughs> um, respected distributors to say, like, why don't you take a look at these 10 pieces that we've spent a lot of time and building that trusted relationship with them so that they know that they're going to get quality that's been vetted from an artistic perspective. And I would also, just to add, you know, say that where quality comes from and, and, and what people are looking for, we're not the first people to know that good artists and, you know, that create good art and if they're in, they have agency that the art will be even better. You know, but and HBO knew that when they did their deal with Issa Rae, you know, they, they gave her a lot more agency than they normally would with a new creator because they knew that nobody else had the voice she had. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then that created more returns. I mean, it's a direct relationship. With Michaela Cole, yeah. she had to fight with Netflix for ownership. You know, mm -hmm. she, she brought it down to 0.5% ownership that she wanted just so that she could maintain the quality of the work that she was creating that was so personal to her. And they said no, and BBC picked it up. And HBO partnered with BBC, and it created, and it's one, you know, one of the people are considering it one of the greatest series of television ever, you know. And I think that 
Having that artists hold equity in their work. Is have agency so over the work is so important. Is and so I think people important. know that, you know? Yeah. And that's yeah. part of what we're trying to what create. What you're trying to train and, and build. Yeah, yeah. That's the um, edu education and training piece. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's also the pipeline, too, for these distributors. You know, they're realizing, oh, if we don't, if we don't have these non-artist producers put their hands in everything, sometimes the art's better. Sometimes the art's more specific. Mm -hmm. you know? and when that, and, but how do we find those artists? Where did they come from? Mm -hmm. How do we know what's good? You know, we're sort of cornering that market and mm -hmm. making it, the pipeline simpler for these distributors. You know. Do you how about do you feel like with Yale and you know your the the um, the portfolio of content that's available? I mean, do you think it's more um, uh, like s things that are going to go live at Lincoln Center, the the opera? I mean, you know, we we kind of went into film, but what about stuff that be can become commissioned for? you know, Lincoln Center or yeah. Lincoln Center Theater or... Yeah. Oh my gosh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, like, because what Lincoln Center has historically done is it has curate, curated and developed the great works. I think the thing, as someone who, my primary um, uh, career path before being a venture capital group, um, was <laughs> in the world of <laughs> opera and musical theater. And I think the thing that always just devastated me was doing a, um, a nonprofit production that you did three uh, runs of, and then it just sort of died mm -hmm. on the vine. And so our ambition is to work with the Met, to work with, um, you know, we've been working with uh, nonprofit theaters around the area to take the work um, that they have developed and to commercialize it and to, you know, build out, product, to build out commercial tours that can go beyond that one instance um, of the production. And this is awesome because we also, you know, by partnering with nonprofits, we get to um, include those nonprofits on the cap tables of our portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. And we get to create alternative revenue streams for those nonprofits. And so again, we're just trying to figure out ways to have everyone work together um, so that uh, the art gets made and then the art doesn't stop as soon as it's done with its limited run. That's great. Um, it's. It's great to see the pathway you've taken and really like, you know, this is what Thai City is about, is for you to, you know, like m mess around with different disciplines and learn how to run, uh, you know, run a business. While you're <laughs> running. Running. Say, mess around <laughs> is not a statement. <laughs> um, do, do you want to, are we, should we move to questions or should I keep going? You can keep going, maybe, maybe five more minutes. Okay. Okay, great. Maybe I can ask a couple oh, questions. Oh, sure, sorry. <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I didn't mean to dominate. We kind of agreed. Since I am on the board of Lincoln Center and I do produce films, I, and I, I thought it would, not, it would be less ricocheting for the audience to have one line of questioning. That's because I don't know anything about art. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have Excuse to be, me. I have to be honest yeah. that when Claire um, offered this opportunity, we were like, absolutely, we'd love to speak with Joe. Is there any chance we could speak with Claire? Oh. <laughs> I just realized I'm the accessory here. Um, uh, but I, I'm interested in the collective nature of your uh, business or your organization. And you say you incubate 30 artists. Mm -hmm. uh, so besides producing their own art, right, producing their own creations, uh, what, how, are they, uh, how else are they involved uh, in the collective in terms of green lighting uh, stuff? And also economic participation, mm -hmm. right? You talk about how uh, an artist will share across mm -hmm. uh, the entire portfolio. So can you just talk about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about our collaboration on Alien. Yeah. Uh, but maybe I can talk about the fun first? Yeah, why don't we talk about the fun and I'll talk about how Alien yeah. is in that. So um, when our artists uh, take on um, their seed funding, it's a $30,000 check and you... Um, uh, allocate 20% of the project to the um, Spark Fund. But what that does, with, with that 20%, what you're doing is you are buying into a percentage of the carried interest that you will get once the fund becomes profitable. And so for um, our artists, this becomes a really um, exciting opportunity to not only dream big and take risks on their own projects, but to also work on each other's projects. Yeah. And so for us, the collective part is, a, is not only a um, sharing of resources, 
but it's also a financial collectivization of um, the profits from our projects, of which you know, we're obviously um, invested across multiple verticals, and um, you know, we're trying to make sure that we are, like, we have a very diverse portfolio of creators at multiple stages. Um, and then, but to a more sort of like artistic uh, collectivization. Yeah, I can talk about um, the project that I was working on. You know, with you our- You are working on. That I am working on actually still. <laughs> but um, I also wanted to add that in terms of validation and vetting, the, those projects that have entered the Spark Fund, those artists are all part of this democratic process of vetting incoming artists. And we think the more diverse the group and the more subjective actually their opinions individually, the um, more accurately, if you can say that, we can assess artwork. So it's not as if it's, it's, it's like two people at the top ask, deciding everybody's work. It's a democratic process. And it, you know, a lot of the times that you see um, some of the stuff that has been producer driven on Broadway, and this is not to hate on um, things that are sort of like forced down a commercial path, but you know, producers have this idea that if you do like SpongeBob the musical, that like that's gonna create a return. Or like Spider-Man the musical, like mm -hmm. people are gonna love it. But those, those actually oftentimes fail, yeah. you know, because they're not, they're not uh, projects that are being driven by artists. Yeah. But, you know, there, my favorite example um, is uh, the um, example of Cats, you know, Cats the Musical. Mm -hmm. You know, no one thought that a musical that was based on T.S. Eliot poetry um, about adults dressed in spandex, you know, moving around like cats, was going to create a billion dollars, which, well, it didn't. It created $3 billion in returns. And I think by employing artists to really act as analysts on each project, you're getting a um, more accurate picture of what um, is going to be culturally relevant and culturally salient, you know? Yeah. Um, there's so much to say there. <laughs> and I'll talk, but I'll talk about my project. Um, and I'm working with two other writers on this project called Alien of Extraordinary Ability, which has to do with this artist, actually, who's just graduated from school in the U.S., he's an immigrant from India, and he has a year on his OPT. Many people here will know this, what this story is about um, before he has to get his O-1 visa. And so it's about all the ways that he's trying to compromise himself so that he can uh, achieve the O-1 and stay in the country. And um, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of twists and turns and, you know, whatever. The, the, um, it's sort of a dark comedy. And uh, we actually began that project out of uh, the need of one of our writers to get his O-1. And, and he was like, well, what if we just wrote about this, what it feels like to be a part of this process in a surreal and comedic way? Um, but there, if we didn't have MOC, you know, there would be no real pipeline for that to get made. But because we did, we went through the incubation process um, and we had our, our scripts and our plan for proof of concept and everything validated by our entire cohort of artists before we received our pre-seed funding. And then with that funding, we've just created a short film that it, we're submitting to festivals right now um, and it's in post-production. Uh, and we're gonna hopefully also be able to use that short film to pitch with our networks to um, producers and to distrib distributors. And so that's sort of, we've sort of hijacked what would have taken, I think, for a show like this, maybe six, five, six years mm -hmm. into about a year. Yeah. And so yeah, it was, that's, that's, one, that's one project story, yeah. you know, of what it looks like. So I am curious, like, what do you, you know, a lot of this is like the zeitgeist, right? Like, like what, is, what is the moment? So, so, you know, how do you pick a hit right now? Like, you know, what is, what do you think the audiences are looking for that's, like, you know, representative of culture today. You know, it's I, oh. oh, go ahead, you go yeah. ahead. <laughs> I, well, first of all, I love to say that, this is so VC of me, but I love to say that um, at the seat level, we do the same thing that venture capitals look for, is we look for Team and Tam. You know, we look for <laughs> a great leader, a great artist who's mm -hmm. gonna have like the gumption and the right. ambition to see a project through to fruition. And then we also look at like what is the what is the market for this, and you know how do we plug this into the market? Um, and uh, so I, I was going to say that um, I also think that like, well, do you want to talk about more culturally like what people are looking for? Well, I mean, <laughs> we could go into my subjective opinion of what I'm looking for, well, but <laughs> I, I would it's say it's a collective. Right? It's you a collective. You must sit there and and. 
I want this, I think that. And, exactly, yeah. and actually, you know, we've developed a lot of different formats of assessing what mm -hmm. everyone's subjective opinion is yes. and seeing where we correlate. And actually, I think what's really valuable about our um, validation process is the subjectivity. You know, there's, I think there's a baseline of uh, talent that's obvious and visible in any writer or well, any, artists can you know, identify craft. Artists can identify, that's actually what we're trained to do, mm -hmm. is to be able to identify craft. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but, my, but of course, even within that, my opinion about a strange loop might be very different from Francis's opinion about a strange loop. However, when you have a collective of artists who are all well-trained, who are all um, highly skilled, I would say, with their own subjective opinions, you have a way to find out what the through line is about a project, then you can get something that's sort of culturally, culturally relevant or you know, significant, maybe. And um, that's what we're doing. And so it's not about me saying, well, that's bad, but it's about us saying, well, it looks like everyone's leaning towards that's something that we want to work on. And you know, our process isn't about good project and then now go. It is about good, skilled artists, driven creator, and how can we give them the resources yeah. and create the best conditions for the most um, uh, beautiful work, you know, yeah. and, and to inspire creativity the best way. And so to me, that is when I think about when people ask, well, how do you know if something's good or, or culturally relevant? That's sort of how we do it on a, on a, on a collective scale. Yeah. And then I have my own personal opinions on my own skills so, too. So do you have any instances where you, people are violently disagreeing with each oh other? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, how, <laughs> how, how do you resolve that difference? You want well, to what's, yeah. what's really interesting is like, be, right now, if you were to go to the conservatory and you were to go into a like, studio experience, there is no incentive for people to be nice to you about anything <laughs> and so like oh. you can bring in like your baby and you're like give me feedback and they will just cut it down because like there's their the resource is scarce right now it mm. feels like but even if people are violently disagreeing in our system everyone is financially incentivized to work together to um, make it a product that we can all stand behind and I mean, we've had some, <laughs> we've had some. I mean, we've had, we've had else. projects. I mean, we've had, for example, in our application process, we've had applications where people, one person thought this is going to be the next, you know, biggest, most beautiful, the next everything everywhere all at once. And someone else was mm -hmm. like, this is just a rehash of Star Wars or something. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, that's really different in opinion. Yeah. Yeah. But then those, the project itself is not the only thing we're looking at. We're looking at the artists and their history. Right. We're also looking at like how the, we were in, you know, it's a, it's a multi-stage process where everyone's being able to input and everyone's being able to assess the whole thing. And throughout all of that, there, there's always been actually some form of through line mm -hmm. in terms of like a direction where we, we, everyone wants to go. And so even when there's a disparate, like a disparate opinion on something, there's usually a way to look at the whole map and find out. Right. What so, like. but you talk about a democratic process. So yeah. does it, at the end, does it mean that 51% yeah. Or is it unanimous? Or, do you have, do to, you be have to be Do you have to all agree? We have a, no, we no. don't have to all agree, but we it's, do have a pretty high um, threshold that they have to majority. pass. And we have like a very sophisticated system that's, yeah. you know, uh, um, uh, like a series of voting um, yeah. and okay. uh, feedback for the artist. And the artist does a traditional pitch. They prepare a deck. They do a presentation. Um, the shareholders all ask them questions. And then uh, they go through this uh, weighted system where they get feedback and um, they get yeah. their score. And if they don't pass, they get to revise, but they don't get funded until they... And it's not like an end of the road, too. A lot of artists have early projects that, you know, you know, nothing starts off at the end. And so we know that that artist might be great in five months. And so we're like, please connect with us. We continued speaking with them. We set up one-on-one -on -one sessions to talk and see where, they at, where they're you know, going and what they want for their project. And when we say weighted system, that's also weighted on our own expertise. You know, I am an opera singer and I'm an actor and I'm a writer, you know, but I'm not an animator. But we do have animators in our group. But I enjoy animation, right? And so we're trying to get all of those to weight in a way where it yeah. makes um, our statistics, I guess, relevant and significant. Yeah, you know, you might want to patent that feedback process and sell it to the other VCs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> We could, we could use we that. We could do that. <laughs> we could do that. <laughs>
<laughs> Sounds pretty complex. Yeah. And, and it works, right? It does yeah. work. I think it does work. Um, we spent all summer, you know, designing the system, mm. and mm. I'm really proud of it, you know? Yeah. Like, it allows everyone to give feedback, but it doesn't prioritize people who don't know the vertical that you're trying to invest in. Yeah. So um, you realize that is actually an IP that you've created within the collective, uh -huh. yeah. and like, that's worth something. And yeah. it's, a, it's a process for deciding what is good art and what is not I good, would love right? to talk to yeah. you more about this during office hours. <laughs> yeah, honestly. Because <laughs> I think it's important to remember that the process doesn't end there. Uh -huh. You know, art can seem bad, and it's actually good at the end of, at the end of getting resources yeah. and being incubated and getting dramaturgical feedback. We just have to have a plan. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's complicated, but, you know, I think, I think artists instinctively know what that is, and we just sort of put it into a structure, yeah. you know. Great. So creators investing in creators. I think it, this is really cool. It doesn't get any better uh, than this. So we have a few questions for uh, our guests today. Um, we believe a lot here at Sci City about peer interactions and how you, know, you can see it just live there. Uh, and so we have some students that actually wrote their questions. Some of them are here present, others. Somehow they said that there was something called midterms, and that's why they couldn't come. <laughs> but uh, we'll start with Claire over here. Uh, she's a student from the School of Management. And by the way, those who wrote questions for us, just raise your hand with your paper, and Matt is going to pick them up. OK. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Claire. and. Uh, so I can see that uh, your effort is try to help the growth of the art industry with needed resources for innovators. So uh, how do you see the potential of the arts sector for venture, uh, venture capital compared to the opportunities existing in other industries? Uh, and in connection to this, uh, as founders, what could be similar or different across industries when you are raising funds via uh, venture capital? Yeah, thank totally. you. Totally. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think this is a great question. Um, right now, there are um, there's not an abundance of uh, creative economy funds, specific funds. You know, people are starting to think this way, but they really think about it in, in the you know. ESG, the impact investing kind of way that they're not really thinking about, oh, this could be a very substantial, viable, um, profitable economic model. Um, and what we are hoping to influence is, and to demonstrate over um, doing this, especially with Yale, is that this is definitely um, a space where people should be investing. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of how we want, Claire, to your point, clear to your point about um, the, uh, the cross industries, I think that, and I started to talk about this, and sometimes this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but in my mind, there's so much synergy between artists and founders, you know, in which artists, you know, they have these big ideas that employ lots of people that, you know, need large amounts of capital and that can reach a huge global consumer base. Well, that's also a founder, you know? And so being able to synergize these two worlds, these two landscapes, and to say they're not so different, and artists, um, if given the proper resources, the proper training, can participate in the same scaling models as tech founders can. Yeah, and I would say to add, you know, I heard two things, potential and opportunity. And I think sometimes we, when we think, especially of arts, when we think of something with high potential, we think that there's, or a field with high potential, we think that there's a lot of opportunity to get in there, but that isn't necessarily the case in the arts economy. Um, the potential is enormous. You know, we, Hamilton, I know. <laughs> 600x Retire. returns or something For like that. For their investors. For their investors, you know, I mean, it, it, Game of Thrones, I think their last season was 3.5 billion, I yeah. think, is how much they, they, how much revenue they created on that. I, I, I think that, the potential is basically infinite in terms of what arts can do. And there's also obviously an endless demand for art. That's why these streamers are so bloated. Yeah. But, you know, the opportunity, that's, that's really different. And I think what we're trying to do is... is let the investors invest directly into the IP itself. Yeah. Rather, than letting, rather than forcing it to go through a studio. 
And I think um, the, the, a lot of the ways we look at the arts economy is sort of these scattered, these scattered unicorns, and people are like, well, where is all that money going? And we're sort of like, well, you can organize. I mean, arts projects are already organized as companies, actually. And we can organize them as companies underneath a VC model. Mm -hmm. You know, it really is just apply. I think it intuitively applies um, very well mm -hmm. to the arts economy. So we have another question from Joe, Yale College. And believe me, we didn't pick these questions because of the first names of the students. <laughs> but Joe asks, uh, this is actually a question for Clara. Um, and you spoke a little bit about um, the pandemic and how um, this affected the sector. So he says, with the pandemic, cultural institutions around the world suffered from lost audiences and even shut down. But you seem to have a more optimistic view of things to come. For example, your family provided $50 million to the renovation of the Geffen Hall in New York. With, so the question is, with more people getting comfortable with streaming content in their homes, how can theater regain its audiences, be more inclusive, and attract diverse theater goers moving forward? Mm -hmm. okay. Wait, how can, what, what was the, how can who attract? Theater. How theater. can theater? Live, live theater. Okay, well, first of all, I, I'm a, I believe in live performance. I mean, and, and I think, well, and overall, I believe in the power of the arts, right? I think it's totally at the core of our well-being and our growth, right? As individuals, as communities, as a society, I, I, it's just something that's sort of deep in my core. Um, um, I just just to quickly talk about the the donation to renovate the hall. I, I saw this opportunity to accelerate uh, the construction, and I just knew that I believed in New York City, and I believed in the arts, and I knew. At that time, a lot of people were, you know, there, there was no vaccine yet. It was actually, now I think back on it, you know, it, it, people were afraid of, um, of making those kinds of donations. But I saw a chance to accelerate the construction, have the fill back in the hall two years earlier than they were supposed to. And I also saw that we could create jobs during the pandemic yes. when New Yorkers needed it the yeah. most. And so... And I'm really, um, I mean, I'm really happy to say that 42% of the contracts um, on that hall went to MWBE um, uh, firms. So, I mean, I, that to me, um, I'm, it was meeting the moment, right? So it's like impact and moment is kind of where yeah. I like to play. Um, but I also do believe in uh, live performance. And why? I think it's because, you know, you, you go into the audience and you're strangers, right? And then... Hopefully, if it's an incredible performance, you're transported, and then you're transported, and you leave a community. And I think we've all had this. You you go to some performance, and then you know later you're like, oh, you were there, you were there, wasn't that amazing? And you know you bring back it brings back this incredible sense of community, and mm -hmm. that's really um, that's really irreplaceable if you've ever felt that. Mm -hmm. um, so that I I believe it's going to come back. Yes, I think. Um, and and by the way, I'm a big proponent of. of programming really more reflecting the diversity of New York, right? Um, so um, that's, we're creating a series that really brings disciplines together and really um, reflects more of what New York City looks like. And so you'll, you'll see more of that at, um, in Lincoln Center going forward. So that's, that's where it's all going and probably needs more programming you know, that you're producing. Well. I, I would say Clara was prescient in predicting the economy because if you took on a construction project right now, your cost, material cost and labor costs would be double or triple uh -huh. because of inflation, <laughs> right? Yeah. So during the pandemic, when nobody was building, uh, the project still continued to move forward and actually wow. created a lot of job opportunities. Yeah. Um, that, that was, uh, uh, yeah. in hindsight, that was the right, uh, right thing, to, right timing. Yeah. And it takes that. I mean, I think it takes uh, like a visionary to know what culturally we need. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's so funny because we try and operate through these studio models, which are like any <clears throat> large institution can be very, very slow to adapt. But I actually think that you employed some uh, like an entrepreneurial and like innovative um, framework to oh. tackle yeah. that problem. Thank you. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Did you plant that question? <laughs> <laughs> like, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll pay you afterwards. <laughs> All right, 
right. Well, our next question comes from, I'm sorry if I put your name, is Tayani from Yale College. Um, and I think it's a topic we've talked a little bit about at Science City when Joe's been here in the past. Um, so this is for Minna Oil Collective. Will you consider tapping into the NFT markets? Based on what I've gathered, Minna Oil Collective is bringing artists to collaborate on producing investable artworks. This sounds exactly like the type of thing that the NFT space has. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> MOZ loves the NFT space. I mean, Ooh. we love, we love um, blockchain technology generally. Um, is Joaquin here um, doing? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so first of all, everyone should get to know Joaquin and um, Ava because um, there's a lot of uh, synergy in what we invest in. We don't just invest in um, film, TV, and theater. We also invest in disruptive ventures. And these are technologies that make an artist's life much uh, easier to produce their art. And so um, one of the things that we've been talking about is like, how do you organize smart contracts so that artists who participate in the development of the program can actually stay on the cap table of the work that they develop? So that they're not you know, paid $500 and then the, the piece goes on to create like significant returns for a studio. Yeah. And so we love, love, love that space. And we're always interested in, studio, in, in um, uh, entrepreneurs who are uh, innovating in that way. Yeah, and to add to that, I think that <laughs> when you say, <laughs> are, are we interested in NFTs? You know, the NFT uh, ethos right now is interesting. And I think the, the initial ethos behind it was to give artists agency, you know? That was the general, the thesis was that, you know, NFTs would allow, would allow artists to be able to have way more control over their work and where it goes. It's just a vague, and I think technology, using technology to affect how artists can be a participant in their career, that is right in line with what we're doing. And so, you know, anything that has to do with that, I think we're gonna support. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, if it comes to us before it, then we'll invest it goes in up, it. we'll invest in it, and we can hopefully make sure that it actually does the thing that it's going, yeah. that it was trying to do, versus become a sort of a bloated. Not only market. will we invest in it, but we'll oh. also give it the market that it yeah. can test itself out on. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Another question from Minute Oil Collective. Um, this comes from Sasha from the School of Management. Given taste of arts and its changes that come with it, how do you maximize the value of projects that haven't hit in the past? that haven't hit in the past. Or that don't hit, necessarily. What was the first oh. part? So given the taste of arts and the, the way it changes, the taste of art changing, mm. how do you maximize the value of projects that don't hit? Well, it's so interesting, right? Because like we do have a VC model and there's a certain amount of um, you know, the bets that we place that, aren't, that don't create returns, right? Like that's the sort of foundation mm -hmm. of VC. But the, inter the other great thing about our model is that even the projects that don't create a significant return still, great, still create art. And so we do get to um, still have it uh, reach its intended audience. We still do get to um, like organize around it communally. And then um, you know, maybe for that piece, maybe it's ahead of its time. And because our fund is uh, you know, 10 years with the possibility of expanding it, um, another 10 years, um, you know, maybe it, get, it gets created in year three, but it really is going to like, reach its intended audience in year seven. You know, yeah. and so like we're like we're just always trying to work with our creators to figure out uh, ways to get their visions out there um, to its audience. So I would say yeah. that's probably the best way. And I would add that you know, just as I said before, in terms of our validation process in our model, you know, the value system we're working under is not you know the value of an artist is not the returns on a single project. It's it's them, you know, and so we're investing in that artist. And so we believe that an artist can create good work and that they're truly skilled. Even if one project doesn't do the, what we want it to do, um, them being part of this, the network and pipeline will yeah. actually create, give them an opportunity to continue to create, which is hopefully And to continue to, be, to provide valuable feedback for other um, pieces that do create returns. Exactly, you know, yeah. they're still part of the process. So, yeah. And one last question from uh, Claire, again, <laughs> from the School of Drama, and this is for Clara. Is this on? Yes. Why do you think interdisciplinary efforts in the performing arts, like the Synergy uh, Initiative you support in California, are important in society today? 
Uh, and this student kept saying, uh, he, quote, he quoted you, saying, we are aiming to create groundbreaking collaborations between artists from different art forms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this is important? Well, I love bringing artists together who want to co-create with others in other disciplines. So I, I really think it, it's really um, not me or my team kind of thinking what needs to happen. It, it starts with the, the founder, the artist, mm -hmm. right? Who, and and um, it's like, who have you always dreamed of collaborating with in another space? And then that's mm -hmm. when you know um, that the sparks and the magic are gonna fly. It's kind of like when you watch chamber music and, and you know, there, it's, it could be good, but when you're really like, when you see the four of, uh, you know, people in the quartet really listening to each other, and so it's just a whole nother performance. And so I'm trying to create um, more experiences like that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the intersection that, yeah, that, that galvanizes me the most. I think that's where it's the most innovative. And I also think, I mean, my sense is that's where we'll draw in new audiences. You draw in new audiences there, and then they might, you know, they might see, um, you know, um, pictures at an exhibition, you know, with a puppet show. But from there, they're going to go back into pictures at an exhibition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then they'll look at more Musogorsky. They'll, you know, it it will it will unlock and be a different entry point into the classical arts. So we would love to stay here and keep burning the midnight oil, yeah. but <laughs> we have a reception a waiting for us. So maybe we can end with final remarks from each of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> final remarks. Yeah. Um, Not to put you on the spot. Um, you know, I, I think I like to end on, on, a, on a blue sky. You know, what, the question you asked about success. That really made me excited, and, I, and I, I guess my final remark would be that I really think that you know, Midnight Oil Collective is an experiment in imagination, and, and, and how, can we act, how can we actionably change a system? And I think that affects everything that most, every student I've met at Yale is in some way thinking about that. You know, we're all existing in these systems and it feels impossible to change, and being here and going and doing the Side City Summer Intensive and working with these people that I've been able to collaborate with has really made me feel like it is possible that, you know, when you come together and you have the resources, that culturally systems can change and, and, and things can get better. And, you know, in the last four years, I've, I've I haven't felt that until now, really. And so I guess that's my final remark. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that. I think that for us, um, you know, there's this there's a student who's in ramp up with me um, named Casey Z. She did the um, what did you call it? The anti Sheen. She just did anti Sheen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anti Sheen. <laughs> anti Sheen. She does sustainable <laughs> fashion. <laughs> and um, she says uh -oh. that you go to um, you go to Sci City when you're obsessed with a problem. And I think that's the culture that they've that you have cultivated here, and that your incredible team has cultivated here. And it lets us grapple with questions about, you know, how do you, you know, how do you wrestle with something like the starving artist? You know, how do you create systems that are going to address these things that we have, that have become tropes? Um, Midnight Oil Collective believes that liberated creators will liberate creation. And um, we think that is going to happen here, starting at Sci City in partnership with Yale and in New Haven. And we're really excited um, to be working with all of you incredible artists, but also with your support. So thank you so much for everything you've done for us so far. <laughs> thank you, guys. That's, Do you have know, any I feel like they're, they're the, final words? No, we're the okay. moderators. <laughs> <laughs> they're the Can stars. <laughs> no has final words. He wants, he wants a final no word. Final words. <laughs> thank you. I, May I just <laughs> indulge me for a minute? Uh, I, I want to say a final, I want to tell a final st story, maybe. Um, so Peter Guber, who is uh, now into sports, uh, he's the owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers and also the Golden State Warriors. Um, he was the president of Columbia Pictures. I believe I have the company name right. And then they sold the business to Sony Pictures. And he, he used to say, you know, the present position was to green light projects and 
invest a lot of money uh, into movies. He said, we used to make 10 movies a year, and two of them will become blockbusters, five of them were so-so, and then three of them are total duds. And then he said, I had this conversation with my CFO every year, and my CFO says, Peter, can you just stop making those duds? <laughs> <laughs> and, if, <laughs> and if the Midnight Oil Collective can develop a system to make the CFO's problem go away, I think you will have accomplished a lot. Thank you. So.